study so far, and we'll um, hopefully wrap up here strongly, and you'll enjoy yourself and have more uh, confidence than you've ever had before in this book that we hold in our hands, the Holy Scriptures. So let's read Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. And this is a prophecy, by the way, of the Messiah, uh, given by the Lord, uh, by God. And it says in particular, uh, an emphasis on prophetic work that God will do through his Messiah in the last days. Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. This is what the Lord God says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spreads out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk in it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of studying your word this morning and just being in fellowship, Lord, being in a place of worship, being in a place where we can bring glory and honor in song, but also in our lives and the responsiveness of our hearts to, to the teaching of your word. And we ask that you would lead every step of the way, both in my teaching and our hearing together and the, the moving of our hearts into greater obedience and greater delight in relationship with you than ever before and greater confidence in your word. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would lead. Fill my mind and my heart and my mouth and strengthen my body uh, to be able to uh, teach in a way that's meaningful and encouraging to my brothers and sisters this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. So for the last few weeks, we've been talking about the reliability of Scripture. We've talked about the inspiration of Scripture. Uh, we've talked about the history of Scripture, the uniqueness of Scripture, the canonicity of Scripture. We've I've kind of unloaded a bunch of, of uh, theological terms on you. You've absorbed it beautifully. Uh, you're, you're becoming more and more skilled and equipped in not just the verse-by-verse the -verse teaching, which is what we normally do in our church, but also in an understanding of some of these key principles, in this case, the reliability of Scripture. If if you've been a Christian any length of time, and even if you aren't a Christian, uh, somewhere along the line, you have been challenged or heard or maybe even yourself challenged people about the reliability of Scripture. People have said, oh, the Bible's been translated so many times, so many thousands of years have gone by. How can you possibly expect that what we have today is actually what God wrote and intended for us to receive as his holy word? So we've talked about uh, a variety of issues that have helped solidify your understanding of the Bible. We've also talked about last week this acronym, MAPS, that's been so helpful. Uh, it uh, deals with the manuscripts, with archaeology, prophecy, and science. And uh, last week we took on the manuscripts. And that, I don't know how you like that, but I loved it. I thought it was great. Not because I was saying it, but because of the information is so astonishing. The mountain of evidence that God has presented to us in the form of the manuscripts is astonishing. It's, it's, it's remarkable. There's no other piece of literature on the planet like the Bible and is well attested to as the Bible. We also talked about archaeology and uh, being a rather new science in the 19th and 20th century. They're discovering person after person, event after event, uh, city after city, uh, king after king, dictator after dictator, wh whatever's out there in the Bible, they're discovering that the Bible was way ahead of its time because archaeology seems to have one of its primary purposes for existence is the establishment of the reliability of the Holy Scriptures. And so we talked about that last week as well. And today we're going to wrap up by talking about prophecy and science and how these two areas of ministry and two areas of both science and also just prophetic fulfillment become another foundation upon which you can base your faith and know that this book that you have in your hand is much more than just 
uh, words on a page, but you have in your hand the divine revelation of a holy God who wants you to know him, who wants you to have relationship with him, who wants you to be uh, a part of his great plan, and also, from a prophetic standpoint, wants you to know what's coming. And uh, what's coming is awesome. Uh, it's challenging as well. We're going to be talking about that this morning uh, in addition to the other things that we're discussing related to science. But let's talk about prophetic evidence. I have to begin by referencing Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 12 through 22. In that section of scripture, uh, God presents his case for prophetic fulfillment. And he, and he basically maps out how you can discern and determine whether someone is truly a prophet of God or not, because there are always people that are, are claiming, especially in the Old Testament, to be prophets of the Lord. And so God, in answer to these questions, uh, details what the requirements are and the qualifications are for a prophet. And it's very simple, 100% accuracy all the time. That's it. 100% all the time, or guess what happens? Come on, tell me, you know. Stoned. stoned, yeah, and not, you know, this stoned. We're talking about rocks and uh, death. And that was the end of somebody that was actually going to uh, presume to speak for the Lord and do it out of their own flesh. And the way that they knew is that if the prophecy doesn't come to pass, that person is not a prophet, kill them. And uh, at the very least, ignore them and don't have anything to do with them because they're not speaking for God. So that's, God, that's God's holy standard. That's a pretty high standard, I would say. 100% all the time. Uh, by the way, uh, many of the cults have prophecies, not very many, by the way, but they have prophecies in the cults, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness and the Moonies and all these different groups have had prophecies to their great embarrassment because when they actually pin dates down, which is almost always has to do with the coming back of their Messiah, their leader, whoever it is, and because it hasn't come to pass uh, and these prophecies were given by the founders of these organizations, the result is, is that they have egg on their face and they've failed the 100% standard of the Word of God, which means that they are to be ignored. So, uh, by the way, if you're ever dealing with Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or, or a cult, one of the most effective ways of evangelizing them is simply to go to their prophetic writings, and you can find their prophetic writings online. Uh, they don't advertise them. When I talk to Mormons or Jehovah's Witness and, and begin to talk about prophecy, they get all excited, and I say, you believe in prophecy? Of course I believe in prophecy. And do you know about you know, Deuteronomy 18, 12 through 22? And they say, uh, no. And I say, well, let's read it, and I'll read it to them, the standard of God's prophetic word uh, for a prophet. And, uh, and then I'll say, do you believe that? And uh, yeah. And suddenly they realize that they're being led somewhere they don't necessarily want to go. And, uh, and then the next thing I bring out is actually the, the copies of the prophecies of, of Mormon uh, theology and also Jehovah's Witness theology. And I say, did you know that your, your founder actually predicted the coming of Christ or the coming of whoever it might be in such and such a year? Because they all have these kind of prophecies. Very few of them, but they have them. And they're in their written record. And I, I said, did that come to pass? And they're like, uh, well, obviously not. And I said, well, wait, let's go back to the standard of Deuteronomy 18. What does that make the person who made this prophecy? A false prophet. You're following a false prophet. It's very powerful. Um, and most, most people in the cults have no idea that these prophecies actually exist. But God establishes this standard for prophecy, and it says it has to be 100%, 100% of the time. But I want to talk to you about um, part of the reason that God gives us these prophecies, but I want to begin with the prevalence of prophecy. So if you're following along in your notes, uh, we want to talk about the great number of prophecies. It's like the manuscripts, it's like archaeology, it's this mountain of evidence also touches the topic of prophecy in the Bible. There's 737 separate predictive topics in the Bible. There are 1,817 predictions in the Bible. And there are 8,362 predictive verses in the Bible. Uh, the result is, is that one quarter of this book, both Old and New Testament, that we hold in our hands and study, is prophetic. That says something. It says something significant. God is trying to communicate something important to us. What is it? Well, there are four reasons that I think are four purposes for prophecy, and I want to go through these briefly. The first is God wants to reveal his plans to mankind. In the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 7, the Lord says, Surely the, the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing it uh, and revealing his plans to his servants by the prophets. That's an amazing statement. God says, I don't do anything without revealing it to the prophets. 
And there's a reason for that, but I love the heart of God uh, that I want to focus on just for a moment, is that God wants to reveal himself. That's part of one of the most significant aspects of friendship, by the way, and relationship is the, the privilege of self-revelation. That's where you kind of let yourself out. You feel safe enough to communicate things with another person that are of significance. And uh, when you get to the point where you're really sharing your heart and you get to the point that you don't do anything without telling somebody that you care, that you care about, that's a really significant relationship. And, and what that tells me is that God loves you and he loves his people and he loves to reveal himself. Um, I, I'm really amazed at the quality of God that he's willing to reveal so much of himself knowing that so many people will be disinterested in what he's sharing, but he reveals himself anyway. That's a hard thing to do. It's, it's really hard. You know, most of us, when we start revealing parts of ourselves and the person is like, oh, you know, is there, you know isn't there anything more interesting to do? Uh, and they've got their phone and they're texting somebody else and you're spilling your heart, you know, and they're just like, uh-huh, uh, uh-huh. Uh, can you, hang on, hang on, I got a call. You know, when you have that kind of a relationship with somebody, it kind of tends to kind of shut you down. But God isn't like that. He reveals himself despite our response or sometimes lack of response to that revelation because he wants us to know his plans. The second purpose for uh, prophecy is to authenticate his exclusive claim to being God, to being deity. Um, in the book of Isaiah chapter 41, the Lord is speaking through the prophet uh, during a time of Israel's rebellion and sin and uh, they're worshiping false idols. They've prostituted themselves to these foreign gods. And this is what the Lord says. He, he calls them out, essentially. And he says, present your case. Set forth your arguments. Bring in your idols to tell what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome. Or declare to us the things that are to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know that you are gods. Do something whether good or bad, so that we will be dismayed and filled with awe. <laughs> you know, I, personally, I like God's humor. I mean, I think that's, I mean, he's mocking these people, which I don't, I don't, I'm not a proponent of mocking anybody, but God is basically calling these people out and saying, if you really are prophetic, if you're really servants of God, if your false idols are really able to produce something, then God says, Call, I'm calling them out. Tell me how the world was formed. Tell me how everything came into existence. That's a lot easier than the next thing he said, which is tell us the future so that we can be, be inspired and awestruck by your capacity in the prophetic virtue. And um, of course, these people are unable to, uh, to, to respond, but God doesn't have any problem responding. He's got over 8,000 verses given to prophetic utterance. And again, his standard is 100% accuracy. Think about the book of John, chapter 13, verse 19, where John is in the upper room discourse and he's meeting with his disciples before his betrayal and before going to the cross. And he says, I'm telling you now before it happens. He unloaded all this information about the future. He told him about uh, his death and resurrection. He told him about the coming kingdom. He told him about his power to overcome. He told him about mansions and he told him not to worry. And he told him that, they would, uh, that he would never leave them or forsake them. He gave them a vision of, of eternity. And he told them all these things, and this is what it says. I'm telling you before it happens so that when, when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. That's God's purpose. That's part of the purpose that God has in Christ through prophecy is to authenticate and identify Jesus Christ as not just a good teacher and a, a skilled philosopher, but as truly who he is, the son of God. So it's tangible, measurable, indisputable proof of God's existence, reliability, and his deity. It's also a phenomenal authenticating proof of the reliability of this book that we hold in our hands. The third reason and purpose for, for prophecy is an expression of friendship, which is, again, just a remarkable thing to me. In the book of uh, John, chapter 15, uh, Jesus says to his disciples during the same upper room discourse, he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. Instead, I have called you friends for everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. So prophecy isn't just uh, for eggheads who want to know the future and try to predict what's going to happen next in the, in the world and global events economically and, and politically. But prophecy is so that we can have friendship with God. He, he's revealing himself to us. And he says, I'm bringing you into my counsel by sharing these future events with you. 
And I'm wanting to bring comfort to you. I'm wanting to bring inspiration to you. I'm wanting to bring hope to you. Because right now, I don't know about you, but there are times if I read too much news lately, it's depressing. You know, the economy's discouraging. Our moral and ethical base is just eroding from our country. Uh, there, there are so many things that are distressing, not just in our United States, but globally. And it's a very difficult time. Uh, but when I read the Bible and I read the prophecies about God's comfort, God's encouragement, the future that he has for every man and woman and child that believes in him, when I read that, I get instantly comforted. And it reminds me, it isn't about this life. This life is not the end. And that comforts me, knowing that, uh, uh, that you know, I'm getting older and, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to be talking about this in a minute when we talk about the law of entropy. <laughs> if you don't know what entropy is, you'll know in a couple of minutes, but it's just basically that everything is degrading and falling apart. Uh, but when I think about myself or other people who are dying or going through difficulty, I get really excited about prophecy because prophecy tells us that God's going to give us a new glorious body. We're going to start over. It's going to be an incredible kingdom that he's inviting us to participate in. And that's the friendship of God. And prophecy tells me that I can trust him. Prophecy tells me that he's reliable. Prophecy tells me that he keeps his word. And prophecy tells me that this Bible that I hold in my hand and that you hold in your hand and that we read on a daily basis can be counted on. The last uh, aspect of uh, the purpose of prophecy is to authenticate the Bible as God-inspired. In, in 2 Peter, uh, Peter writes in chapter 1, verse 20, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke, as they, uh, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So, so the Bible itself emphasizes again that the written word that we have that's been not only inspired by God, but preserved by God all these millennia is uh, authenticated through prophetic utterance and that what we have is actually from the heart of God. So these four reasons to reveal his plans, authenticate his deity, express friendship, and authenticate the Bible are very encouraging to me and they should be encouraging to you as a believer as well. I want to talk about the persuasiveness of prophecy. Uh, the pers persuasiveness of prophecy takes me back to the manuscripts and to archaeology. The persuasive of those two fields of study are, are overwhelmingly supportive of the reliability of the Bible, and prophecy is no different. There are over 300 prophecies uh, that are in the Bible about the first coming of Christ, and there are many more about the second coming that are yet to be fulfilled. But um, some people, uh, actually Josh McDowell, uh, if you know his work of Evidence That Demands a Verdict, uh, decided to do a study to try to grasp and understand and then to present the power of prophecy uh, to people that he was speaking to. So he took eight prophecies, and you have these listed in your bulletin, I believe, in your notes. So I won't take time to go over them in detail, but he chose eight very well-known prophecies that related to the first coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, the first was the birthplace of Jesus, that it was Bethlehem, predicted in Micah 5 and fulfilled in Matthew chapter 2. The time of his birth, predicted in Daniel 5, by the way, 500 years before the birth of Christ, down to the very day. It was predicted it would be 483 years from the day King Cyrus made the decree to rebuild Jerusalem until the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And that was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 21, verse 9, again, to the day, 500 years before the event happened. The manner of his birth, the virgin birth, uh, predicted in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. That's a really big prediction. I mean, I know that there are some people throughout history that have said that it was a virgin birth, uh, but only one really happened, and that was uh, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. The price of his betrayal, a, a seeming kind of, uh, you know, nuance of minutia of information, and yet significant that Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, predicted in Zechariah 11, fulfilled in Matthew 26. The manner of his death, crucifixion, uh, predicted in Psalm 22, fulfilled in Luke 23. Uh, that may seem like, oh, well, that's not that big a deal, except for the fact that that prediction took place 800 years before the Romans invented crucifixion. 
The piercing of his side predicted in Zechariah 12 and fulfilled in John 19.34. People mocking, which is not what you would expect in literature that is presenting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the creator of the universe. And yet the Bible told the truth, predicted in Psalm 22 and fulfilled in Matthew 27. His burial in a rich man's tomb, highly unlikely uh, for a crucified man. They were scorned and, and their family was shamed and they were buried in potter's fields and in vacant lots, basically. There was no honor whatsoever. And yet we find in scripture in Matthew 27, 57 through 60 that Jesus, uh, by virtue of the prophetic nature of God, was buried in the tomb of a rich man of Arimathea, Joseph. And so uh, Josh McDowell took these eight prophecies and he worked on developing uh, an understanding through a, actually another scientist, Peter Steiner, uh, who took the math probability of these eight prophecies coming true. Each of these prophecies, by the way, were completely outside the realm of, of uh, control of Jesus to fulfill or to even participate in, except for the fact that it was prophetic and he was the fulfillment of these uh, God-divine appointments of prophecy. And so in, a, in an interesting book that Peter, uh, Peter Stoner wrote called Science Speaks, uh, he used the law of compound probability to determine that these eight prophecies, in order for them to come true, all eight of them, the chance factor of that happening, you know, the random chance factor is 10 to the 17th power. So that's 10 with 17 zeros behind it, which is such a big number. We don't even really have a name for that number. Uh, and so Peter Steiner decided, well, that we're going to try to find a way to communicate that in some sort of a visual word picture. And so he said, if you had 10 to the 17th power silver dollars, that would be enough silver dollars to cover the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. That's a lot of silver dollars. And to continue on with the illustration, he said you would send a man blindfolded out into the midst of that silver dollar, stir it all up over the entire state of Texas, and then mark one of those silver dollars after it's been, before it's been stirred up, stir it up, and then send him out blindfolded. The chance probability factor of him picking up that one silver dollar is the same chance probability factor of just eight of the uh, prophetic uh, predictions about Jesus Christ coming to pass. That's pretty significant. By the way, for those of you on Kauai, uh, most of you, some of you have never even been to Texas. It's a great state, by the way. Uh, one of the states that's actually uh, got a $4 billion surplus and is, is uh, not in debt, and they actually are cutting their, uh, their costs and their expenses and the, um, um, the entitlement programs in order to uh, make their budget, and uh, Texas is doing quite well right now. Uh, but those of you that haven't been there, the Texas uh, square mileage is about 267,000 square miles. That's a lot of, of territory. It's a big place. In Hawaii, all of our islands, including the little uh, atolls and the, the smaller islands that aren't even a part of the seven island chain, uh, all together amount to 6,424 square miles. And so if we were to use a silver dollar illustration of 10 uh, to the 17th power using chance probability factor with the same blind man with the same one silver dollar that's marked, the whole mass stirred up. We're talking about 85 feet deep in silver dollars across the entire chain of the Hawaiian Islands. And you send a guy out there, and by random chance, blindfolded, he picks the right one. That's the chance probability factor of these eight prophecies coming to pass. Well, uh, this has been taken further <laughs> than, than the eight prophecies. Someone else uh, decided they're going to take 16 prophecies and see the random chance probability factor. So now with, with uh, 16 prophecies, we move from 10 to the 17th power to 10 to the 45th power. That's a, that's a number with 10 and 45 zeros behind it. That's a very big number. So in order to uh, keep this illustration going, basically what you would have to do is you would have to get enough silver dollars to make a ball that's 30 times bigger than the distance between Earth and the sun, which is 93 million miles away. So 93 million miles times 30 is the size of the sphere of silver dollars that would be represented. And with that sphere of this massive thing that's just bigger than anything practically in our universe, uh, we would have this, uh, uh, this silver dollar that's marked and you send out a blind man. The chance of him picking out that silver dollar is the same chance probability factor of 16 of the prophecies coming true. And we have 332 prophecies 
all fulfilled exactly, precisely in time, location, city, person, name, you name it, it's there in the Bible. An overwhelming amount of evidence that the Bible is not only true, but absolutely reliable, 100% accurate, 100% of the time. I want to talk about scientific evidence. And um, the scientific evidence is quite remarkable. As you know, many of our sciences have been in existence for, in some cases, a couple thousand years, but many of them are brand new in the last, you know, few centuries. Archaeology is one of those in the 19th and 20th century. It's a brand new art form in the science realm. Uh, but many of our sciences are just making major discoveries in the last 100 or 200 years. And, uh, and interestingly, uh, the Bible anticipates 20th century discoveries in the area of astronomy, biology, geology, physics, and archaeology with astonishing accuracy. And the reason is, is that we're not talking about a man-made book, and we're not talking about translation errors, and we're not talking about lost documents. We're talking about a document that has been inspired and preserved by a holy God that wants us to know him, know the truth, and have complete confidence in this book. Why is it important, by the way, to have complete confidence in this book? Because life is hard. Life is challenging. And actually, to be honest, the, the advice that the Bible gives us in so many arenas of, of life seems to be contrary to logic. You know, if you want to live, die. If you want to be, a, uh, if you wanna, if you wanna, uh, be great, be the least. The whole heart of this gospel is completely contrary to our natural thinking. And so we have to come to this word and be willing to let the word and the people in it who made mistakes be our guide and our tutors so that we don't have to live that way. And so the Bible is filled not only with positive instruction, but also with warning and guidance about the lives of people who didn't get it right. And by virtue of not getting it right, they are instructing and encouraging us. So the, the idea that we have to kind of bumble through life and learn by all these terrible mistakes and all this sin and all the consequences is not true. And it doesn't mean that we're going to lead a perfect life, but it means that we can live a life that's pleasing to God, a life that's really fruitful. We can avoid, especially as the younger men and women here, you can avoid wasting your life trying to amass wealth and riches because the Bible already tells us that's not going to go anywhere. That's not going to achieve anything eternal. And so you can make really wise decisions as young people to live for Christ. It tells us that, you know, your family is really important. Well, that's a really important message for young men in particular who tend to want to make everything else more important than family. Neglect your family. And yet the Bible tells us that we're to, we're to nurture and teach and admonish and encourage and instruct and model for our family what a truly godly person is like. And so God calls us to these things and he gives us the privilege of saying, you know, God, you're smarter than me. And prophecy helps me to recognize that. And by virtue of that, we can walk in a life of abundance and a life of love and a life of, of uh, godliness in the face of God and sometimes in the face of challenge and difficulty in our culture that's constantly challenging uh, the scripture and challenging even our relationship with the Lord. But let's talk about the scientific evidence that we have. And I want to begin with a quote from Sir William Herschel, uh, who, by the way, was not a believer when he started his studies. And uh, to be honest, I'm not sure he's a believer now, but this is what he says. Uh, and he says this related to science, in particular archaeology. He says, all human discoveries seem to be made only for the purpose of confirming more and more strongly the truths contained in the sacred scriptures. So this is an agnostic, a man that doesn't believe in God, and yet he comes to the conclusion after his years and years of research and study in the science fields that everything that they discover seems to only be supported already previously by the word of God. There are 11 scientific discoveries that are really significant in our, uh, in our understanding of science uh, that are found in the Bible, and in some cases, 4,000 years preempted and scooped by the prophets. So I'll go over some of those with you this morning. The first is the time-space matter issue. Uh, that may seem like, well, that's not that big a deal, but it was a ra radical discovery in the 20th century that there is time, space, and matter. By virtue of that, there had to be a beginning and scientists now acknowledge that. And so in the 20th century, they finally came to the conclusion because previous to that, they thought that, that life was eternal and it went on forever. And in some respects, they're correct. But they thought that there was no beginning. And that was where they were wrong. And through science and physics in particular, and their research and their studies, they recognized that there had to be a beginning. And there was a beginning. And so the time 
uh, space and matter issue uh, was verified uh, by three physicists in Britain, uh, Hawking, Penrose, and Ellis, who proved in the 1960s and 70s that indeed space, time, and matter had a beginning. And so the Bible anticipated that by 4,000 years because the Bible says in Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, which is time, God created the heavens, which is space, and the earth, which is matter. So those three things that, you know, scientists, it, it, it rocked the scientific world. And now it still uh, changes everything on the, on the landscape for science in virtually every arena and field of study when it comes to science, this time, space, and matter. And yet the Bible in the opening verse of the opening book of the Bible affirms all three of these things. Man discovers it, and we write books about them, and they have special places in our scientific community, and yet God scooped these guys by 4,000 years. We find also in 2 Timothy chapter 1.9 and Titus 1.2 uh, that uh, God says again and again, this grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. There's a beginning. There's a place, a starting point in history. Robert uh, Jastro, who was a, a NASA astronomer, said in the foreword of his book, God and the Astronomers, uh, that he is an agnostic. He uh, acknowledges that. I'm an agnostic. I'm not so sure I would be, uh, you know, bragging about that. In Latin, it means ignoramus. Uh, and so uh, agno agnostic means I don't know anything, you know, and he's going to write the foreword of his book and said, I don't know anything, uh, but he knows about science. He just doesn't know anything about God, and he, and he acknowledges that. I don't believe in God, uh, and he really should just call himself an atheist, which is I don't believe in God versus an agnostic. So if you're not a believer, uh, at least claim an agnostic, I mean an atheist and not an agnostic. Uh, but he uh, writes in his foreword that he's an agnostic. He says he examined the scientific evidence uh, from the 20th century with regard to astronomy and cosmology and came to this conclusion. Now we see how this astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The chain of events leading to man commence suddenly and sharply at a definite moment in time in a flash of energy and light. Unfortunately, he uh, didn't come to the conclusion that God brought this moment to pass, but he believes that the Big Bang brought that moment to pass. Of course, no one can explain the Big Bang itself. They just believe it happened, and then from that, everything else uh, developed and evolved. In another book uh, that he wrote in 1989 entitled Journey to the Stars, he said this, Most remarkable of all, astronomers have found proof that the universe sprang into existence abruptly in a sudden moment of creation, as the Bible said it did. Every time this guy writes another book, uh, he brings God more and more into the equation because there is no other rational, reasonable explanation. How about atomic structures uh, in the area of physics? The book of Hebrews chapter 3 says something really profound uh, that, uh, uh, that is now got a lot more light shed on it because of, uh, of physics and the studies in the area of physics. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that, this, that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. This is like a riddle. What we see isn't made out of what's visible. Go figure that. Well, nobody understood ultimately what that really meant until we discovered the atom. Once we discover the atom, we realize that all matter is made up of atoms. All that matter is, you're just a pile of atoms, you know? Uh, the chair you're sitting on is a pile of atoms. This tent, everything, the world, it's a pile of atoms. And it's organized and structured in remarkable ways by God. But nonetheless, it's a pile of atoms, none of which can be seen by the naked eye. And God preempted this, this, this 20th century discovery in the book of Hebrews by saying that what is seen is not made out of what is visible. We have another um, discovery, the Earth being suspended in space. Uh, for most of human history, people had uh, legends about how the Earth was hanging out in, in, in space. They understood, because of the stars, that the Earth was probably a part of that, that uh, universe, but they didn't understand how it could be suspended because they understood, obviously, enough about gravity to realize, hey, big, heavy things tend to fall. In fact, everything falls. So how is it that this massive uh, Earth isn't falling? And uh, so they came up with these legends about, you know, it's sitting on the shoulders of Atlas. And then other people said, no, it's sitting on turtles. And other people said, no, it's sitting on, you know, four big Asian elephants. Of course, no one could explain what those things were standing on. 
But the, re but the reality is this, is, this is human history's attempt to understand, without God, how this earth is actually being suspended. And yet, 4,000 years ago, Job confidently asserted in Job 26, verse 7, that God spreads out the northern skies over empty space, and he suspends the earth over nothing. Isn't that great? That's amazing. And that, uh, uh, that concept of, of uh, God spreading it out or suspending it uh, is clear in the Hebrew that there's, there's no strings attached. You know, it's just God suspended it. God said that the earth would be suspended, and so it is. And so again, modern day science, they discovered, well, lo and behold, the earth is suspended over nothing. And uh, they don't completely understand how it all works. They can describe it, but they really don't understand how it all works. And of course, just the, the nuances of just a few thousand miles this way or that way, you, it, you, the, the, you that have been in science class in high school or college, you know that the, the tolerances of everything related to human life is so tight that if you just change a few things, the temperature difference, the water mass difference, the depth of the ocean, uh, the height of the mountains, if you change just anything slightly, everything goes haywire and it won't work. But God holds everything in the palm of his hand. By the way, there are dozens of statements like this in the book of Job that, uh, that predated modern science. How about around earth? Uh, we had quite an interesting little discussion about this last night during the teaching uh, in our service last night because I couldn't remember who actually discovered that the earth was round and the reason I couldn't remember is because we don't know. <laughs> uh, was it Magellan? Was it Columbus? Was it Copernicus? Nobody really knows. Nobody really actually claimed it. But one of the things that we know is that, is that uh, the, the seafarers uh, in, in the 1400s or so, they were, they were seeing the horizon come and go and it just, they kept going and it always seemed to be going that direction. And so they had this hunch that the earth wasn't flat, which is what the prevailing thought was at the time in the science fields. And, uh, and so, but the Bible tells us in, uh, interestingly, in Isaiah 40, uh, 40, chapter 22, that God sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. So he sits enthroned above this circle of the earth. And this word circle translated from the Hebrew is sphere, which is a giant round globe, which we know the earth to be. And so in the Bible, way back in Isaiah's day, we already have clarity that the, that the earth is round. But because men at different times and different seasons of life refused to believe the Bible and go to the Bible as a source and they went off on their own, it took them thousands and thousands of years to come to the right conclusion on their own. But again, it lends support, significant support to the reliability of the scriptures, even in the sciences and the earth sciences. How about uh, ocean currents? Uh, ocean currents are amazing. It was in 1800s uh, that a sailor named Matthew Fontaine Moray circumvented uh, and circumnavigated the globe from 1826 to 1830. And in 1848, he published a book called The Physical Geography of the Seas, detailing these oceanic currents of the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. And, uh, and this was a new discovery uh, that actually the psalmist wrote 2,000 years earlier. But we know about these, these currents in the ocean. We're going to talk about currents in the air next, but, but these currents in the ocean were virtually unknown. And, and people, scientists, were trying to figure out how did these whales get here to there so fast, you know? How did, these, how did the, this, uh, this underwater, almost like a people mover, except it's moving fish and even material, how does it work and where is it going? Well, the Bible actually talks about this in Psalm 8, verse 8. The fish of the sea uh, are there that swim the paths of the sea. So the psalmist, you know, and keep in mind that David is, is next to the Mediterranean. It's not a part of these, these ocean cycles. And this, this uh, does anybody remember what that's called? This, uh, the path of the sea? The Gulf Stream. Thank you. Thank you. So this Gulf Stream exists, but nobody knew it. And now, of course, you know, uh, wayfarers and shipping companies and everybody harnesses this to shorten the trips and to, uh, to take advantage of the power of the ocean. But it was predated by 2,000 years by David in his psalm. The wind patterns, this jet stream that's above ground up in the atmosphere, was another 20th century meteorological uh, discovery that was long ago described by King Solomon. In Ecclesiastes 1.6, he says, the wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. Now, who would have known that? I mean, who could possibly know that? But God gave it to these writers because they didn't completely understand these things, but they took God's word 
for what it said, and they believed it. So round and round and round, around the globe of the Earth, these jet streams flow. And of course, now our modern day uh, jet liners take advantage of that. And they, uh, they fly in that jet stream. Uh, helium balloonists that are trying to circumnavigate the world, they, they get into that thing, and it goes 60, 80, 100 miles an hour. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a remarkable thing, and it affects our weather patterns all across the globe. It's actually touched on the issue of meteorology and allowed uh, people that are actually predicting our weather patterns, what's coming, and so much of it hinges on that, that jet stream that was, that was uh, described for us in Psalm 8. Um, I'm sorry, in Ecclesiastes 1.6. How about the water cycles? I remember being in, in um, um, you know, Earth geology classes and in earth sciences in seventh grade. And you remember studying about, you know, the, the rain falls over the mountains and it gets in the streams and it flows down the streams into the rivers and then the rivers spill out into the ocean and then it goes out into the ocean and then uh, the heat goes on the ocean and evaporates the water. It goes up and forms clouds and the clouds go back over the mountains and they drop water and here the cycle goes on and on. Well, that discovery was only made 300 years ago by two European scientists, Pierre Perrault and Edmi Marriott, and they discovered this concept of oceanic evaporation. And they proved that evaporation from the ocean produced clouds that produced rain over the land and then produced streams and then went into the sea, and the cycle continues. Unfortunately for these two great scientists, they were scooped by over 3,000 years by Amos, who wrote this. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. And then Solomon said this in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 1, All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. And so in the Bible, by thousands of years, we have a, a, a description of this cycle of water and how it replenishes the earth, waters the earth, finds its way back to the sea, and then finds itself evaporate, evaporating back up into the cloud mass and then beginning again. There, if I, this discussion that we're having right now, is it a discussion if one guy's talking? Okay, <laughs> this monologue that we're having right now uh, could go on and on and on because the truth is, is that every aspect of science seems to only serve the purpose of sub substantiating and validating the reliability of this book that we have in our hand. The, the number of stars in the universe, up until just a, a few hundred years ago, people thought that there was only four to 6,000 stars in our universe because that's all they could see until Hubble telescope. Anybody old enough to remember that? Any, any gangbangers that were, you know, in El Paso remember those days when, when uh, Hubble telescope? Okay, we got the pastor here, the old guys, us. Uh, so we remember the Hubble telescope. And I remember when they first took those photos and they came back, uh, you know, uh, through the, um, uh, the radio signal that it was sending off. And we were all blown away. Do you remember that? How amazing it was, the clarity. And suddenly the biggest discovery of all is, oh my goodness, this universe is far bigger than we ever could have anticipated. And so their predictions and their estimate from, went from four to 6,000 to 100 billion stars just in our galaxy. And then they said, in addition to that, there are over 100 billion galaxies with each their own 100 billion stars. And so now they, they've come to the point that they said, we, we don't really know if the stars can ever be counted. In fact, we're coming to the conclusion that the more powerful our telescopes become, and the farther we send away our shuttles, and, and they take pictures, the more we're convinced that there is no end or beginning to this particular universe. There's a beginning of time, but in terms of its extent, it's so massive, we can't even predict anymore whether there's a beginning or an end of this universe. And uh, once again, the, the Bible preempted modern scientific discovery by almost 3,000 years when Jeremiah said this. Um, I'll skip that one, but that, no, I won't. I'll go with Jeremiah 33, 22. He says, I will make the descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister before me as countless as the stars of the sky. If you've been a Bible reader for any length of time and you read the Old Testament, one of the things that's always compared to the thoughts of God for us or the love of God or God's plan or purpose for the inheritance of the saints, it, he says it's going to outnumber the stars of the heavens and the sand of the seashore. And if any of you living on Kauai, just go pick up a little thimble full of sand. That's quite a job, just counting that. And God says that his, his thoughts toward us, and that may be an important point for you just to kind of ponder on just for a moment, his love and his thoughts toward you outnumber the stars and outnumber the sand of the sea, the individual grains. 
And Jeremiah tells us that, that these stars and the sand of the sea are countless. Well, that was, a, that was a, a new discovery in the 20th century, and yet God knew. The expanding universe. You know, scientists are now discovering that the galaxies are actually moving away from each other, which is extremely important for the field of physics and, and cosmology because it's, t it's teaching us about how things work and how things fit together. And it also tells us about the time frame of when the world actually began. That beginning point is, is now becoming clearer because of the fact and the, and the uh, substantiated evidence that our planetary systems are moving away from each other. There seems like it's like, it's like an explosion in, in essence that is just is moving. It's moving at a very slow pace, but nonetheless it's moving. And this is a new discovery within the 20th century. But the Bible says in Psalm 104 that the Lord stretches out the heavens like a tent. In Isaiah, it says that he who created the heavens and stretched them out. This word in the Hebrew is in the present perfect tense, which means that they are continuing to be stretched out. So the work of God, even in the grammar of the Old Testament, matters. And he says that, that God created all this, but it's being stretched out. It's continuing to be stretched out. And yet it's a modern day discovery. It's like, oh, wow, we just discovered that the, that the universe is expanding. Well, the Bible had that information already. The orbit of the sun. Ancient civilizations thought that the heavenly bodies moved around the earth. Well, we discovered that that's not accurate. And again, in the Bible, in Psalm 19, David clarifies uh, this the orbit of the, uh, of the constellations and the system of our galaxy and our universe and how it spins. The law of thermodynamics is the one I'll finish up with. Uh, but in the last 150 years, this has been probably the most um, incredible discovery as it relates to the sciences because the law of thermodynamics affects everything. And there, there's many laws with the law of thermodynamics, but the first two are the most important. And because of that, they're number one and number two. The first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of matter. And that, that um, just basically states that nothing ever really disappears. Remember we talked about atoms earlier? Atoms never go away. They can change form. You might have a liquid that turns into a solid, that turns into a vapor, but it's still there. Um, so people that have lived in the past, they're still around. They're floating around. They're in graves. They're in our atmosphere. They're uh, under your table, at, in, behind your couch. Uh, you know, they're just... <laughs> I probably didn't need to say that. But physical matter just never, never goes away. It's always there. That's the first law of therm thermodynamics. And it's interesting that in Genesis, uh, we t it, it talks about that as well as Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon says, I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. There's nothing new under the sun, literally. Not just in your life and your life experiences, but there's physically, physical matter. There's nothing new under the sun. God works with what is here. The law of entropy is, uh, is the last law that we'll talk about. And this is the law I mentioned earlier about physical conditioning. <laughs> but most people prior to the last several centuries believed that the universe was eternal and that it never would wear out and never grow old. But the second law of thermodynamics tells us that everything is degrading. Everything is wearing out, including our universe. And, uh, and if you weren't convinced of that, uh, get in front of the mirror sometime. And uh, as you get older, you, you watch things happen that you didn't think could happen, but they're happening. And, uh, and you realize that time is, is taking its toll. And, uh, and so your, your very body is a demonstration of the truth of the law of, of thermodynamics and the law of entropy. And, but the Bible predicted this and tells us in Psalm 102, he says, in the beginning you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens and the, are the work of your hands. They will perish but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them and they will be discarded. So don't feel bad if your life sometimes feels like it's falling apart. It's a part of the, the law of thermodynamics and it's a part of the law of entropy. And what that really prompts me to do, especially as I get older and I watch things happening to my body and watch things happening in the world and watch things happening in life and I'm watching things happening on a spiritual level, there's a part of me that's like, oh no, I want it to stay the same forever. I actually have this heart that things won't change. Are you like that a little bit? You want it to be like it was about 10 years ago or 20 years ago in some respects? But God says, no, it's, it's going to change. That's good information for me to have and for you as a believer because what that tells me is I can't hold on to this life. I can't hold it on to it physically from a, from a standpoint of living. I'm not going to go on forever. There's going to be a terminus for Bob and for you. 
All of us. So we face that. It's really good information when God tells us the truth. Don't you think? I'm so glad he tells us the stand-up truth. Sometimes it's hard to hear. You know? You're in sin. You have to repent. Oh. You know? You're, you're, you're going to hell unless you don't have a relationship with God. That's harsh. These are truths that the Bible lays out along with a myriad of other truths that he tells us for our good so that we can have life and not have life just here in a world that's decaying, but life eternal in a world that will never decay and never change and will be eternal in the presence of God without tears or sorrow or sadness and joy forevermore. And it's coming. And it's for us that believe. And so I want to encourage you, God has given us all this truth in, in the manuscripts, in archaeology, in prophecy, and in science. And the evidence is absolutely, it's, it's not just a little bit of evidence. It's not like a couple of stabs at prophecy or a couple of stabs at science. It's the Bible is full of this kind of information. And God, in essence, by his spirit, is shouting from a mountaintop and saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so many of our problems in life can be met through this divine, supernatural revelation of not just a, a, an a all-powerful God, but a friend, a savior, who knows everything about you and still loves you, who knows every mistake you've ever made and still has a plan of redemption and has a plan for fruitfulness for your life, who has been there in the hard times and the joyful times, and is still here with you. And for those of you that are believers, he's drawn you into his family, and he's made you a son or daughter of God, and he said, you are my friend. And more than that, Jesus Christ says, you are my bride, and I'm coming for you. I have a plan, he says. And he prophesies and tells us what it is, that he's going to come for the church. He's going to clean up this mess, and he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and he's going to reestablish it. And the part I like about God there are a lot of parts I like about God, but on this particular topic, I like that he doesn't start over from scratch. No, he's going to redeem it, just like he did with you. He didn't wipe you out and start over with a new person with your name and your looks. No, he starts out with you. And he says, I want you back the way you were meant to be made in my image. And so he gives us that chance and that opportunity through salvation in Christ. And he's going to do the same thing with this fallen earth. The earth, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, is groaning under the pain. The, the Bible says the earth actually is suffering this law of entropy and the, and the impact of sin upon it. But our Savior is coming, and he's going to redeem all of it. And in the meantime, he gives us this privilege of being his ambassadors and speaking the truth about this God, this book, and this revelation. So I want to encourage you today to be men and women that are solid in your belief and confidence in these scriptures. And because of that, you will be men and women of this word and that you will be men and women that love this Bible and love to expose yourself to it and to study it and to read it and to memorize it. That's what this church does. That's part of the, the DNA of our fellowship is that we're people that believe this book, we apply it, and then we go live it. This is the calling that we have as Christians. And it's the most joyful adventure. I call it the epic life. It's the life you were meant to live. It's the life you were meant to experience. It's the life that God has planned for you. And the sooner and the more consistently we can simply just humble ourselves and say, that's what God says, I'm on it. The sooner we'll experience the fullness of the life that God's intended. So my encouragement is walk in it. Stand on this book. It's a remarkable document, life-changing always will be, always has been. And God says not a jot or a tittle, that's the dot of an I or a cross of a T, will be diminished or disappear until everything has been fulfilled. 100%, 100% of the time. The same heart God has for you. 100%, 100% of the time. Yield to him today. Father, we thank you for this time and for your word. And uh, 